Welcome to Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Each week, we talk with industry leaders in both marketing and entrepreneurship and business to find out all about their wins and failures in marketing. Right now, we'll hear all about their successes and wins and what's fallen flat so that you can take that knowledge and implement it. Learn from the best, from the folks who've been there and done it all, as well as people just like you. Thanks for joining us. This is Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. And welcome to this week's episode of Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Uh, this week, I'm very privileged to bring to you a guest who's, who's close to my network um, because I am actually in business with him. Um, please welcome Bill Bacon for the show. Bill, hi. Hi. Yeah, we're, we're also on audio, so you, you actually need to speak. Waving's not, not, you know. Hello. Right, let's... It's not just a video podcast. I know, I know video is my thing. It's like where we are. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to circle back around to Phil in a moment in terms of his background. Let, let Phil do an introduction of himself. But um, Phil and I set up Market and Help Desk. Uh, uh, where are we at? Nearly eight, well, just over eight months ago now. Uh, known each other for the best part of five years. And the reason I have Phil for so long is He's one of the few marketers that I have worked with in person, have seen in action, and understand full funnel from from front to back, including sales in with that. And there's not many marketers that I can speak for that have such a, a deep understanding of the sales side of things as well as marketing. So Phil's views are always a good balance view for most businesses. And big shoes to fill here, Phil, when you do start talking, by the way. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I know. Just before we move on to that, obviously we've got our our sponsor statement. So if you're listening to this, you know I'm all about building content at scale. Uh, sometimes you just need faceless video reels to get content out there. Uh, the problem with a lot of footage banks is they just don't look native to social, and that can actually hinder your content performance. Really bad. So GridBank.io uh, are our sponsors for the show. Uh, they're a database of endless vertical, authentic video clips for pumping out content, A/B test thumbnails, and creating. If you're looking to get ahead on socials without burning out your team, you get 10% of your annual subscription. Just hop over to the website at gridbank.io, use code Paul, and you'll uh, be able to get access and 10% off that annual. It's your Alan Mark. So, so, to the episode for today. And circling back to the, the episode now, Phil, I would love you to drop at least one fun fact. I know you have many. Um, Aside from being a DJ, there are other fun facts about you and your business. So share okay. the audience, if you would. Um, fun fact on me, personally, I could breathe fire um, like a dragon. Uh, Paul's quite insistent that I record this as a video and set fire to myself. We need this. Um, campaigns, so like on past, past campaigns, could be... Uh, that I've managed to sell best part of ten thousand pounds worth of Viagra by email, which, considering it's a massive trigger word, everything trying to get blocked get into your inbox, is reason a reasonable order, really. That's quite a brag. Quite a brag. We'll we'll not ask questions as to where the Viagra came from. We'll leave that for another episode on another tour. Oh, not personal stock. Okay, as long as we're clear on that one. Good, good. But if you um, so, if in luck, then you need same day delivery, pointing in the right direction, whilst breathing fire. Um, I love it. I love it. Um, Phil, would you do me the honour of sharing a little bit of your background with the audience and so kind of understand where you, uh, where your roots are in marketing? I guess you, you come to us as a marketing expert as opposed to just a business owner. Uh, I'll say just. Like I'm just a business owner as well, um, but obviously you, you wear both hats most days. And so, how did you get involved in marketing? Okay, so accidentally, it's it, in reality. I started off life in as a techie. I was working in IT, and uh, where we had a website, and it was left to the IT department to look after because it involved a computer. I moved on from that role and moved into a manufacturing company and uh, lo and behold, look, there's a website that must be looked after by the IT department. 
And uh, from there, that then grew out photography, design, bed management, uh, CRM management before CRM was a significant thing. And uh, yeah, that was kind of where I started really. Um, as part of that, I had to build up a strong relationship with the sales team as well. That's kind of where everything kind of grew from. Marketing and sales have to work together. You've done that um, at various sizes of company as well, right? Like, so it's not just not just smallish companies, not medium sized companies. You've done that at the enterprise level as well, right? Yeah, I've done that across. The, I've done that across the board. Um, one of the th- one of the things I've always maintained is, as soon as I walk into a job, um, when it's been me, I've got to make friends with the sales team because they need me, and I need them. Because without the two, they don't work. And then when you then now, well, say then now, that also spills over into the customer experience team as well. Because actually, sales and marketing both need customer experience, and customer experience doesn't exist without marketing. So it, yeah. it, it becomes this quite well, like beast. To be, to be fair, it doesn't exist without sales either. They all have their part to play. I actually. A, a, a wonderful quote the other day by by Antoine, who's, who's going to be our guest on another podcast uh, in the not too weeks. Um, Antoine's a, a quite a well known figure in the in the sales development industry. And what he what he quoted is, and this is this is rare, right? Coming from a sales guy, and he said that you know sales is just a function of market. It's not a separate entity; it's a function of market. And I think that's an interesting perspective to take, um, and, and probably the right perspective, whether people want to admit it or not, right? Yeah, it, it depends on how you depends on how you want to lift. You could look at look at marketing and things, the fluffy side of sales. It's the pretty bit, the bit that lo- that that lures people in and gets them interested, and then sales come along to the the agile, hardened sales people come along to flog it. Um, but in reality, that shouldn't be the case anymore. It should be it, marketing should have done so much of the legwork before. It, the marketing teams should have done so much of the legwork before they get to point of con- actual fiscal conversion. The the sales is just a natural progression. Is it fair to say that in the modern day, you know, do do buyers come to the funnel for the market and all the sales funnel? Do they come further down that funnel than they ever used to before? Is that what you've seen happen? Well, there is no di- no difference. There is no difference between the marketing or sales funnel. They are the same funnel. For a start, they don't necessarily come in at a different. Po- they'll they'll come in at different points because of the way they've come into it. So, somebody who has been somebody who comes in because they've come in by a word of mouth has probably been very well nurtured before they even get into the funnel because you don't know about you don't know about them. You don't know who's been talking to them, and they basically being told you need this they come in right at the end ready to but they don't need that nurturing but then you get others that still need a level of awareness because they know who you are but they might, ne- ne- might not necessarily know what you can do and why what you do is good for them and that's that's think, really important do you think that customers in the modern day need certainly I could, if we're going to look at SaaS specifically or software specifically, do you think like the trend is that customers have done or interested to do much more of the research themselves before they reach out to market and also for more information? Do you think that where we're headed as a as a country, I guess, or a geography? Is it geographical? I don't know. I think it very much depends on the type of company you're talking to because some companies will want a level of spoon feeding especially bigger companies where they don't want to have to do the research themselves. They want people, to be, they want somebody to tell them how their platform will make their business better. What's, what improvements, why they should go to you. And ultimately, especially with SaaS, why, what return are they going to get by using them? It might not be a, you're going to be 20% more profitable, but you're going to be 15%, you'll have 15% more time across your team, which ultimately means 
you have more capacity and your team can make more money or produce more whatever than you're, what you're making. I mean, you might be digging up coal um, and buying a SaaS platform. So I guess to, to zoom out a little bit then, you've been running Bitcoin marketing for how long now? Four years? Almost, yeah. Yeah, so, and that will put you bang smack so, at the beginning of COVID when, when you launched Bitcoin. So what have you seen change over the last four years in terms of customer demand for your services? Like when people come to you, what are they, are they now looking for different things than they were during COVID or is it just accelerated and seeing at the same place? Customers have seen, well, customers for us have definitely clearer idea of what, well, uh, no, actually they either have a, a much clearer idea of what they want and a very specific specification which may or may not work and then it's our job to unpick it and put it in something that is bio, uh, as campaign viable um, or they have no idea what they want but they have a very specific problem and they're much better at articulating that problem than they were so typically it's and actually one of the key things is is around leads we aren't getting any leads. We don't get leads. We aren't getting leads. We don't have how to get leads. It's like, okay, right. Well, marketing is now becoming much, much, uh, especially within smaller businesses, it's much more, we want leads. We need leads. We need them now. And it's trying to educate people around the necessity for consistent and well-performing campaigns that build up trust with your audience and actually long term they do generate what they want but there are several stages within that before you get to the end result you can't just have something you can't just turn something on today and have it deliver 100 percent of what you want tomorrow not unless you're going to throw an awful lot of money at it Nicely into the first question that I generally ask our our marketing experts on the show, which is, what's one thing that you would change for small business owners in regards to their marketing and their mindset with marketing, or one thing you'd ask them to stop doing? So I guess for you, probably safe to assume that it's to to understand a little bit better about that short term results versus long term results and that platform of consistent reliability that builds up all the time with marketing, right? Sort of, yes, because it is, it is all around consistency. It's just, just know that it will take time. If you're starting from scratch today, the work that you do now in marketing, you may see some, in, you may see some very, very short term results that have, uh, have an impact straight away. But those short term results have had to be outweighed by the fact that you've now, then got six months of nothing coming. No, no results coming in off the back. And then it puts you in a position where you feel disheartened that you're doing all this work, you're doing this marketing, and it's not having an impact. Whereas bigger companies will be putting their heads down, keep going, push forward, because they know that it will come out the other end. So small businesses need to have a much more bigger, they need to be thinking much more like bigger companies so that they... Ex so there's an acceptance that it's not going to work immediately and the work you do now has long-term benefit. And I know, I know it's like somebody who started a business a year ago, I've been down this exact path and I'm, I preach, I preach to my clients that they need to keep their faith for the long term, but I still have days where I sit there and to your point exactly, I'm sat there staring at the screen thinking, I need something to come in, I need something new or and is this working? Should I be doing something different? Um, I think it, it probably boils down a little bit also to the fact that people who are confident enough and experienced enough to start their own business have experienced that moment, certainly within corporate life or within previous roles where they need to pivot regularly. If something's not working, you don't just stick with it, you move on to something. However, that's kind of the opposite for a lot of marketers. Whilst you shouldn't stick with something that doesn't work, you've got to steer with it long enough to prove it doesn't work, right? Yeah, but there's ways in there's ways around 
pivoting without having to pivot, pivot. So your content strategy isn't working. That doesn't mean to give up on content. It just means change your strategy. So don't just go, oh, well, blogs and social posting doesn't work. Well, no, it won't if you just stop it completely and forget about it and go, right, well, I'm not going to do that anymore because I did it for three weeks and didn't do anything. One, you need to build up consistency yeah. and you need to build up trust. I would, I would, so let's take content marketing out and strategy as a, as a good example here. Build a plan, define your goals, define your activities and hold yourself accountable for doing them the same way that if you were in a bigger company, you'd be the marketing executive, the marketing manager, the marketing apprentice, and you'd have a boss holding you accountable for it, but you're now the boss, but you're also now the marketing person So you need to hold yourself accountable for doing those things. And then you need to measure the results of those things, not tomorrow, not next month, but in three months time to see what impact those things actually had. And if you start to see improvements or because of the things you did three months ago, that's when you know things were working, not, oh, it didn't work immediately. So I'm going to do something else. So it's, yes, there is a, there is a need for change and a need for pivoting, but it's not pivoting out of what you're doing. It's pivoting within what you're doing to something different to find the part that works because every there are very few parts of marketing that won't work for almost every business. It's just how you implement those things. It's also quite frustrating working with lagging measurements where you have to, you know, trial it for three months before you can decide whether you've had any form of success or not. Um, I, and, and I think that, I think that's probably only going to get worse as, as we move forward as a, as a race, right? Like if I look. But we commented as I, as I opened the podcast, I looked down at my phone and I had 43 notifications. I'd only not looked at my phone for an hour, 43 notifications. And of course, you know, we live in an age where, yeah, we're, 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 we're trained for, um, endorphins and adrenaline rush in the, in the now you've got to, phone, you've got to answer the notifications yeah. for a result now. And this is one area of life where we just have to accept that we need to be patient with it to treat it with respect and dignity, I guess. I don't think anybody's ever said that about market before, but it's, it's an element of that, right? Like it's, it's I to be then to, to, to change aspects a little bit, um, you've obviously worked with a lot of different clients across a lot of different industries, um, lots of different size businesses. Is there anything that you're seeing trending right now that seems to be working more or less across the board that was working well in some regard for pretty much everyone that maybe wasn't in the not too distant past? It's a tricky one because actually there are, are some things that work across most industries, but then there's certain things that just don't work in others. So anywhere where there's a security element, um, so cyber security, for instance, um, it's much harder to sell. And a much harder thing to market when you try to do it through sort of cold outreach. In fact, it's, it's not impossible to do it through cold outreach um, because it literally goes against grain for everything that it stands for. Uh, so that then comes back to how else to how else do you do it? Well, the answer there is to start looking at other activities and not just go with the flow with everybody, incorporating both digital and offline activities. People don't consider both. Oh, it, digital is very straightforward and very quick to implement. And with the, yeah, exactly. You can do it AI powered this, that, and the other will create most of what you need very, very quickly, be it not always amazing. Um, and you still need to give it a good polish, but it gets you eight percent of the way there for 20 percent of the work but then you forget that there's everybody else like you is doing that same thing so it's you're just you're just filling filling the the hole with noise and nobody can hear what you're saying so you need to do something different and 
companies that do something different will succeed. I'm not going to say what that thing that is different is. Because one, you need to speak to me about that. And your thing that's different is different from each other. Because if everybody did the same, it would still be the same. There's a really powerful note though, and and I've heard you talk about this a lot before, and I've seen I've seen the impacts of it. Is that thinking offline because everybody yes. just wants results now, and it ties into the point we made earlier. So everybody wants results now. So the, the quickest thing you can do now is a digital something, whereas actually the best results often come from that offline touch point. You know, I I, I do a lot of networking, and actually yep. with my with my close network, sometimes just pick up the phone to people and if I, I forget that I can do it but when I do I have amazing conversations probably way better than any video or conversation that we have or anything because it's like you try and focus on something else whilst you're on the phone you can't but yeah like, like having that phone you've got their entire attention just the same as that moment when they open the post when you open the post there's nothing else happening because you're focused on opening the post and, and often you look at email as, as you call it like that's, that's probably an unfamiliar term to us I've never heard of it till till I heard you speak about it. I see it everywhere now. But, you know, long email is something that I, I reckon most businesses don't even think it's possible for them. It's cost pro. The thing is, for some, they'll see it as cost prohibitive. It's really not. Given that its return is significant, as long as you've got something, to, as long as what you've got to market is worth marketing, which if you're, if you're running a campaign, you're actually doing this, then it should be. Um, yeah, it's not that uh, a uh, direct mail campaign B two B is going to have an uh, it's going to have an impact because you've got the experience of opening something up. It's a tactile one; you don't forget about it. Uh, with some of the th- some of the sort of people that we work with, the getting stuff through the door is is is, is the easy bit. Getting it past reception is the tricky bit. But we've got our ways. We've got our ways for that. There's no problem. We're generally no problem doing getting past that. Um, but then there's also making sure that you actually do something with it. So it's all well and good sending somebody something in the mail. But what do you do afterwards? Do you just leave it? Well, hope that they pick up the phone and call you or email you or send you a carrier pigeon? No, you need to keep it. That's just one part of an entire campaign mix not it's not an individual active it's not an individual campaign it's a it is an activity within one camp i oh, in the middle of right we're in the middle of setting up a campaign for an event at the moment as seven channels activated for this for this campaign we've got 30 32 days i imagine a lot of people have put off because that sounds really complicated and, and i know it won't be simple to think, but there's coordination having to be done and it's a little bit kind of connecting channels together and making sure you're managing across multiple channels. Yeah. That's what has the impact and it will yeah. return if you can give it a go. Uh, in this case, a lot there'll of the be... time I speak to people who just want results for zero commitments. They just, they just want to have it done. Like, oh, there must be a package I can select. And like, no, you've got to put some work in. Certainly in the early days of running the business, you've got to put the effort in and it, Sadly, I know a lot of business owners set out to achieve one thing. Like they have a business goal, they want to help people with a particular problem. And they, as you do when you set up your first business, I know I did. Like I assumed I'd spend a lot more time working on the actual problems I solve than I do on the marketing and sales side of things. And actually, the reverse is true. I spend 80% of my time marketing and selling, probably about 20% of my time solving problems for my clients. And yeah. maybe at some point, I'll be able to afford some team that will help me change that that bandwidth slightly but you know it's it's something you've got to accept if it's easy you're probably not putting enough effort in yeah lean into it and this thing is plenty of ways to make it easier but at the same time you still have to invest that time in the first place to get it there yeah i think that's probably the one thing that i i take away from all all the things that i do is that if i'm going to do something i'm going to assume that it'll work and I'll put the effort in to make it um, rubber stampable. Yeah. Next time I just go to do it. And sometimes I'll do that and, and the effort's a little bit wasted because actually it didn't work. So I'm not going to do it again. Not, I don't have time to create a template or, or whatever. 
but nine times out of 10, it's there and I've done it the first time or I've done it the second time. Yeah. The first time. And the other time just works. Go and leave it until you've done it five or six times to, to, to build that template out because you've wasted so much of your valuable time. I think that's that's kind of where I like to see business on. I, I just want to help business on get back to doing more of if you're going to be doing market and do the right things, stop, stop doing things that don't work. And if you're, you know, you are a business owner, do as little market sales but that knowledge that when you're doing it, do it 100%. Yeah. Bill, is there anything else you'd kind of like to leave the audience with in terms of your experience on, in market in the, in the last couple? while that you've been involved in it. What's what's the tip way that you would like to share with the audience that you you've learned through all the roles that you've held? One key thing. One key thing. And it's a very, very simple one. Know what your goals are. That's it. If you don't know what your goals are, you can't measure it. If you can't measure it, you don't know whether something's been a success or not. I love that. Awesome. Phil, if people are listening to this and they want to know more about how Beacon Marketing can help them, how can they reach you, mate? Uh, Carry a pigeon, um, number one. Bidy pick, number two. Or they could find me on LinkedIn um, or go to our website, www.bakingmarketing.co.uk. Make sure all the links are in the show notes as well. Uh, yeah. Phil, it's always a pleasure, mate. Keep coming on the show. And um, if you've been listening along at home and you've enjoyed Phil's insights, I'd love you to kind of reach out, drop us an email at the show. Um, either drop Phil a message or drop drop me a message. You've got all my details in the, in the show notes already. And we will see you next week for our next guest on Market Pull. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to feature on a future show or you've got some ideas for folks who would make a great guest, please drop us a line. The contact details are in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Your host today was Paul Banks, founder at Javelin Content Management. Javelin specialize in helping busy business owners just like you to repurpose video content, taking all the stress and tech problems away, and turning your long form video into literally hundreds of pieces of content without breaking the bank. If you want to launch your personal brand, become the vendor of choice for your audience, or maximize your sales revenue impact, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for the next episode, and don't forget to give us a subscribe and a review. Our podcast is only possible with your support.